Good evening. I'm Tracy Pavlishin. I'm the Executive Director for Campaign Management at the University of Chicago. I'm also a proud graduate from Chicago Booth Class of 2006. Thank you for coming tonight to the eighth event in the Fall Harper Lecture Series. We started in um, Chapel Hill and we are concluding in Mumbai next month. Tonight's event in Boston is the eighth in our series. And in fact, technically it's tied because we already had an event in London earlier today and we're having another event in San Francisco. I hope you're enjoying the chance to connect or reconnect with the University of Chicago and with one another. So I'm here to talk about the University of Chicago campaign inquiry and impact. Before I do that, I'd like to share with you what's been happening on campus this week. It's homecoming week, and on Monday, we distributed nearly 1,000 t-shirts to um, students to help on, Mon on Maroon Monday to help Chicagoize their wardrobe. <laughs> we also had a special homecoming shake day. And right now, over 25 student groups and houses are painting banners at Henry Crown Field House in preparation for the annual homecoming banner competition. And this weekend, we will welcome over 4,000 families, alumni, faculty, staff, and students to campus for homecoming and um, block party festivities. And while you can't attend in person this year, I hope you'll consider returning to campus next fall to join in the fun. These activities and many more are planned for this fall to help celebrate the university's 125th anniversary. Our university was founded on the basis of philanthropy and the University of Chicago Campaign Inquiry and Impact honors this milestone and tradition. We want to engage 125,000 alumni with the university. And of course, we also want to raise $4.5 billion. <laughs> I'm pleased to share that so far we have raised $2.7 billion towards this goal and engaged nearly 56,000 alumni who have made a donation, attended events, volunteered, or participated in social media channels. As a Booth alum, I love data, so let me share some stats with you. Engaging 125,000 alumni represents 80% of our population. So this is truly an ambitious goal. Massachusetts is home to 5,000 alumni, 4,000 of which reside in the Boston metropolitan area. 34% of our alumni here are graduates from the college, 24% from Chicago Booth, 11% from the Social Sciences Division, and 6% each from the Law School and the Division of Humanities. 56% graduated since 1990. And by 2019, which is the end of the campaign, our target is to engage 3,425 alumni from Boston. We are 47% towards that goal already, with two-thirds of this engagement coming from donations. As you know, it's important for alumni to engage with the university on multiple dimensions to help strengthen and extend a powerful network that fosters personal satisfaction and professional success. Your attendance tonight is a great step in this direction. Thank you. So I'm asking you, if you haven't already, to please consider investing financially, serving as a mentor, hiring an alum, volunteering with the alumni club, and connecting with the university on social media. We have um, a very fun photo booth um, over here that um, I'm happy to say does not reflect today's current weather. So um, after the program today, I hope you'll go over there and take some fun pictures and imagine it being cold since it was well over 70 degrees here today. And as President Zimmer says, we are asking you to do still more so that the University of Chicago in the coming decades will succeed far beyond reasonable expectations. Thank you for coming tonight and please enjoy the event. The University of Chicago is urban. Global, courageous. Unusual. Phenomenal. Rigorous. Fabulous. Outspoken. Economics and pizza. Pushing borders. Invigorating. An intellectual crucible. That pushes you to be your best every day. 
From its inception, the University of Chicago focused on rigorous, intense inquiry. It's defined everything about what the University of Chicago is today and what it will be in the future. The core curriculum is the symbol of who we are. Our mission is to get very talented students and to put them through a program of systematic, interdisciplinary training and four years later graduate Chicago intellectuals. I'll bring up a discovery that we've made, then I'll proceed to criticize my own discovery. It's through self-criticism you create a learning culture of critical inquiry. We aren't just talking at each other, we're, we're listening. And at the end of the class, I may have a completely different perspective on the issue. Some excellent, excellent students over the years. They were very much my teachers. It changed my work. It just exposed me to a world of ideas. I was the beneficiary of a scholarship from the University of Chicago. I could not have gone to business school without that scholarship. I just feel so grateful that I was that I was selected to kind of be among the minds and the intelligence and the, the incredible people. It's been the best experience of my life. I think supporting young people to pursue their dreams opens up the world to you. All we ask of anybody is that they do the same to the next generation. The university is really made by the people in it. Really very competitive. Very unruly. Seeing all the crazy, amazing things that they're doing. Curing diabetes, cancer. Innovation, more entrepreneurship, new ventures, new technologies. It really forces me to push for something beyond what I'm doing. In higher education today, the humanities are really in retreat. We really think that it's a responsibility to continue to foster growth of the humanities. The Collegium will allow teams of humanists from all over the world to tackle problems that society needs to deal with. The uh, Institute of Molecular Engineering is organized around solving water, energy, health problems through designing matter from molecules up. Just solving one of all of these problems that we're working on would be tremendous. You're part of an intellectual community that attracts individuals who are intellectually fearless, that will bring together experts from different disciplines to help solve problems. We're exploring opportunities to create more portals for the community and people in the city to come into the university and both get some of the knowledge that we have, but also share their knowledge with us. Lots of people are skeptical about the ability to use social programs to prevent crime. What we've tried to do is to generate Evidence that is so rigorous and so compelling that the most skeptical skeptic will have to acknowledge that there's really something here. One year of participation in the Youth Guidance and Becoming a Man program reduced violent crime arrests to these kids by over 40%, which I think really challenges the conventional wisdom that the only way that you can control crime and violence in the United States is through locking up millions and millions of people. And if you show the impact, it has global reach billions of people, not just millions, billions of people that you can get to. It's very important in a world which is becoming more integrated that you have these global universities. We now have a rather more ambitious global strategy with the same gold standard quality of curriculum and teaching. Students are going to want an experience of understanding other cultures because this is going to be the world that they are functioning in over the coming decades. Can we bring people, scholars, politicians, administrators from these different areas also together to discuss what's going on, to debate the big challenges facing the world? Human illness limits society, and accordingly, fixing that, addressing it, is hugely important. It's transformative. I uh, had been diagnosed with metastatic or advanced breast cancer. The first thing Dr. Fumi Olapati said to me is, I want to find out more about your tumor so that I can personalize the treatment for both you and the tumor. The survival rate for metastatic diseases was one to two years. I really must say that I have survived the odds. I mean, I'm still sitting here, uh, standing here um, 10 years plus. You know what? It's worth every day getting up and supporting patients like her. We have an enormous obligation to the people who gave us the opportunity today to do what we do with these young people. And in turn, they have an obligation to support those who come after us. The question for us today is, how do we realize these values in a powerful way going forward? 
Together, we are spreading grace and humanity. Together, we are thinking about ways in which you could have an impact on society. Together, we have the potential to change the way people think about urban problems. Together, we make amazing discoveries possible. It's part of our DNA. It's who we are. It's a big, big universe here. Ours is the university of great discoveries. Ours is the university of fearless inquiry. Ours is the university that develops ideas that change the world. I'd like to extend a welcome to all the alumni and guests uh, to this evening's uh, program and also extend a special welcome to our colleagues at the Marine Biological Laboratories. I am Rene Mora. I am a graduate of the Biological Sciences Division. I graduated in 1988 and the Pritzker, Pritzker School of Medicine in 1989. Currently, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Larynx Partners. I'm also the immediate past president of the Alumni Council of the Medical and Biological Sciences Alumni Association. Just a reminder uh, that the Alumni Council uh, consists of 32 alumni volunteers um, who work to provide services both to existing students um, and alumni of the divisions and the, and the School of Medicine, and also to strengthen the connection between the, uh, the, the, the strength of the alumni community and, and the connection between alumni and, and, current, uh, and current faculty. Uh, for 125 years, the university has a, 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 a tradition of both attracting and supporting faculty that does transformational research and the Harper lectures are, um, re reflect the, uh, the, also reflect the tradition of bringing alumni and faculty together to celebrate uh, the work that happens at the university. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Gilbert, um, and I will have to read this. Dr. Jack Gilbert is the group leader for microbial, microbial ecology at Argonne National Laboratory Associate Professor of the Department of Ecology and Evolution, Associate Director of the Institute for Genomic and Systems Biology, and Adjunct Senior Scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory. He's authored more than 150 scientific papers on microbial ecology in a variety of environments, including our built environment and, uh, and the human body. So his research explores the interface between the microbial world and our lives and does it in such a way that it blurs the distinction between different ecosystems. Um, regarding the work that Dr. Uh, uh, the Jack does at the Marine Biological Laboratory, just again, for those of you who are not fully aware, uh, he, uh, he works within the Bay Paul Center for Comparative Biology and Evolution. Uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory has been affiliated with the University of Chicago since July of 2013, and the work and the work that uh, Jack does at the MBL is an excellent example of the kinds of exciting partnerships that this affiliation is making possible. So tonight's lecture will be Adventures in Our Microbial World, uh, and in this lecture he will explain how microorganisms in the various environments shape our health and development. So the, there's a complex emerging new human ecosystem which may be both the source and the solution to modern health concerns, including depression, anxiety, allergies, and autism. Dr. Gill. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. I never get to come to Boston and actually look around Boston. And today hasn't been any different. I, I came into the hotel and I sat in the hotel room and I, I missed that opportunity every single time. And the cameraman's going to get upset with me if I move around too much, so I have to stand in this nearly exact location. And that's going to be really pertinent to you three people right there. Uh, I'll explain it. <laughs> so, um, I am a microbial ecologist. I'm also English, um, not British, as some people might think. I have nothing to do with Scotland or Wales, it's just England. Um, but I, uh, I, I am very interested. I came here in 2010. Um, I was a joint appointee at both Argonne National Laboratory and the University of Chicago. And then when we partnered up with the MBL, I became a triple threat. So I'm University of Chicago or Argonne or the MBL, depending upon what your flavor is of the week. And um, I, 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 the MBL is actually uh, a fantastic opportunity for me because I'm actually a marine microbial ecologist by training. I, I worked for a private consultancy firm in the UK before I came back into academia. And 
working with bacteria in the oceans. And so for me, when we acquired this, I was like, wow, this is awesome. We got the MBL. This is, I mean, not acquired, partnered, sorry, partnered. Um, <laughs> this is awesome. It's brilliant. I'm, I'm really excited. So I, I, I threw myself into the crucible of, uh, of the three institutions and are now trying to bridge the gaps by, uh, as you so eloquently said, blurring the lines between our ecosystems. Um, if a marine microbial ecologist can start working in the bacteria that live inside our body, that means I can work in pretty much any environment in which I find bacteria. And luckily for me, that's all environments <laughs> everywhere, right? Uh, because they're so pervasive. Um, but the human body is still a fascinating ecosystem for me. It's an ecosystem which is fundamentally uh, evolved in a sea of microbes. Okay, you know, um, uh, if you think about multicellular life crawling out of the oceans, that was about 400 million years ago, and Neil Shubin constantly reminds me that that's still an important fact I have to deal with. Um, if you ever watch his show, by the way, it's, uh, it's, it's brilliant, The Inner Fish. Um, but he, the, these organisms that we call, well, the, these beings that we call humans, um, I, I, I often come from the microbial perspective, and you have to understand that for me, that's my fundamental level. Everything else is just blurry lumps of matter. But this lumps of matter has evolved in a microbial context, right? It, the body could not keep bacteria out. It could not keep viruses at bay. It was technically impossible for the organism to evolve mechanisms to do that properly. So it evolved techniques to integrate microbial ecosystems into its body, right? It evolved mechanisms such as innate and adaptive immunity, the, the brutal force approach of innate immunity to kill everything randomly, and the adaptive capabilities of adaptive immunity to evolve to look at the particular organisms it wants to kill and the particular organisms it doesn't want to kill, it wants to keep around. But the problem is we've evolved those mechanisms because we were constantly being bombarded and exposed to many, many different forms of bacteria, many different forms of viruses. But now in our modern world, we've reduced that exposure. And then what we're looking at now are the, the ways in which that, that disruption of our interface with the environment has somehow impacted our health. And it's, we're seeing it all around us and in many people that you'll know who have food allergies, who have neurodevelopmental disorders such as depression and anxiety, autism, Parkinson's. These are people who have potentially had a triggering event through a disruption in their microbial cells. Now, we have 100 trillion of these bacteria living inside us. That's about three pounds of bacterial biomass, most of it centered here in your gut. And that is that's the same weight as your brain, bear in mind. You've got the same weight of brain as in bacteria. And, um, and if you removed all those bacteria, you'd survive as long as you were kept in a little bubble, um, so, uh, completely isolated from the rest of the world. You know, and we do that to animals. We call them germ-free animals. We take all their bacteria away. But when we do that, we take a bacteria, like a mouse, and we take all of its bacteria away, it grows up physiologically disturbed. So this is the healthy cecum of a, of a mouse. It's a part of its gut that contains most of its bacteria. And if we, if we grow a mouse without bacteria, its, it's uh, cecum looks inflamed. It looks enlarged, okay? Um, its gut looks significantly different to the way it does when the bacteria are present. The removal of those organisms has caused physiological anomalies in the development of that mouse. And it's not just in its physiology, it's also in its neurology. Um, oh, okay, I'll come back to that because that's cool. Um, yes, I did only prepare my slides. No, no. Um, it, its neurology is also a significant component of that disruption. This is a, a great example. This is an elevated uh, maze. It, the uh, platform is about a meter high. And either side of that platform, we have a little box. If we place a normal mouse inside that box, it's going to do one thing. It's going to hide. It's going to stay inside that box. It's going to hunker down because it's anxious about showing itself to the rest of the ecosystem, right? And that's for a good reason. The mouse that stayed hidden didn't get eaten, and therefore it gave birth to more mice, and that progeny lived on, okay? And hence you evolve a, um, uh, through selective uh, adaptation, you evolve a mechanism of anxious activity, okay? If we take all the bacteria away from the mouse, and we've got a germ-free mouse, that mouse loses all that anxiety. That, that mouse then becomes neurologically disturbed compared to its natural phenotype, right? This mouse is no longer behaving the way it should behave in the native world. And because, that's because the bacteria in the gut of this animal are communicating with the brain through the release of certain chemicals, through the stimulation of the immune system, through the, through the interaction with nerve endings embedded inside the gut wall 
the bacteria are actually sending signals in a near continuous fashion to the brain. The part of your response mechanism to, um, to satiation after you've eaten enough food, you know, you're now full, is actually due to changes in the immune profile of your gut um, because the bacteria are now responding in a different way because the system's been fed. And that sends nerve impulses up into your brain, which changes your um, appetite, right? You're no longer hungry. But this is constantly happening. And when you have certain types of bacteria missing in this environment, it sends aberrant signals up to the brain and aberrant signals to the rest of the body, which can change the way the body's responding to this environmental stimulus. Okay, so in, in the mouse model, this is particularly prevalent. Um, a mouse can be made to be uh, anxious or made to be non-anxious based on the presence or absence of bacteria. But in humans, it's the opposite way around, right? Our, our native state's probably not anxious and severely cripplingly depressed. But the absence of certain organisms may be inducing that state. And a lot of my research is focused on now on trying to uncover that, that mechanism by which the disruption of bacteria inside your body influences your potential depression phenotype. We look at this especially in, in pregnant women, uh, so perinatal and postnatal depression, and in post-surgical depression, and in mechanisms whereby um, uh, depression treatments, so, such as antidepressants, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and the like, when we consume them, whether they have an influence on our depression or not is, is changed by the types of bacteria we see in our body. And so actively trying to uncover that mechanism is a key component of our research. I'll go back to this because this is cool. So bacteria can induce allergies in our body, and we don't know why. Working with Kathy Nagler at the um, University of Chicago, we've uh, started to uncover that the environmental exposure that we get inside an environment is significantly lower, probably because of all those cleaning products and the rampant use of antimicrobial agents. And that micro that's led to our healthy microorganisms that are normally associated with our body being disrupted, okay? And then potentially leaving us open to um, allergies and asthma and various other conditions. And what we're looking at is how to reinforce the healthy microbiome inside the body of children so that they are no longer allergically over-responding to particular conditions um, and particular stimulants. Um, this, uh, so we now have a uh, food allergy research and education network at the University of Chicago, and we're actively utilizing that to take the research out of the lab and put it into the clinic where we can actually help children as soon as possible. And this is fundamental. The acceleration of getting research into a form which is practicable and, and helps people as quickly as possible without being held up in red tape is fundamental to advancing medical science, advancing any kind of science. And we've been really key at the University of Chicago and at the Marine Biological Lab and even at Argonne in trying to get scientists like myself to integrate with industrial people, so people working in companies. I've actually started up two of my own companies off the basis of that by trying to develop commercial applications for my own research. I'm not going to talk about those because that would be a conflict of interest. But <laughs> if you're interested, you know, come and nod me afterwards. Um, bacteria can make you obese or make you fat. One of my friends, uh, Li Ping Zhao, he used to be a very heavy set guy, 385 pounds, and he lost 113 pounds by going on a traditional Chinese whole grain diet. Right? It's not a particularly pleasant diet, um, but you know, it, it works and it's been shown to work for hundreds of years. And by doing this, he, um, he actually changed his microbiome. His bacteria were different at the beginning to the way they were at the end. Yeah, of course, you know, you're changing the ecosystem inside you. You're adding different things. Before, he was eating a lot of fats and, and sugars, and now he's changed it to a different type of, uh, of composition, mostly fiber, and that's altered the ecosystem. And when he's the ecosystem altered, altered, the players inside him changed. One particular organism, Enterobacter cloaceae B29, which was really abundant when he was on a heavy set diet, like a high fat, high sugar diet, and was absent at the end of his um, whole grain diet, uh, seems to be able to induce obesity in a mouse. We cultured that out of Li Ping's uh, stool um, from when he was obese. And when we culture it and put it into a mouse, the mouse gained significantly more weight than um, when the mouse didn't have this organism. Um, this is the mouse without it, this is the mouse with it. So the introduction of one organism can somehow concomitantly influence the obesity phenotype in a mouse, okay? Now, this is true whether you have a germ-free mouse or a mouse that's already got bacteria inside it. So even if I add, if, if the only bacterium present inside that mouse is Enterobacter cloacea B29, it will still put on more weight for the same amount of calorific intake, okay? 
But if it's, uh, if it's got a load of bacteria in there already, then the addition of this organism can disrupt the phenotype of the mouse additionally, still causing it to gain weight. This is a great study from uh, Ruth Lay's lab at, up at Cornell, but I like to highlight it because it's the opposite side of the fence. Um, in monozygotic and dizygotic twins, you actually have an interesting uh, phenotype. Monozygotic twins have a more similar microbiome. These are identical twins, a more similar microbiome than, than people who aren't genetically identical. It's not, it's not the way you think, though. These, these people aren't still microbiologically identical. They're actually microbiologically still um, uh, unique. I can tell each one of those twins apart based on the bacteria living in their stool. And I can do that for every single one of you as well, and that will be important later. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but what's interesting is, you know, uh, if you have, if I have a genome of every single one of you, I'd be able to predict whether you're going to be obese or not um, with about a 50% accuracy rate, right? So I'm, uh, your genome is not very good at predicting whether you are going to be obese or not. It's not necessarily in your genes, okay? So you do have that situation where you have monozygotic twins, one of whom is obese and one of whom is lean. And when you look at the microbial profile between those two individuals who are co obviously controlled for their genome, um, the lean twin has an abundance of organisms um, belonging to a family of bacteria called the Christmas Salaceae. These organisms are, show a high hereditable function. It looks like they're passed down from mother to child, mother to child, mother to child, ad infinitum. Okay? So, and we'll talk about how that happens in a minute. But what's interesting is if you do this experiment, this is one of my favorite experiments of the last, of the last recent years in terms of proving this as a, as a study. If we take the stool bacteria from an obese twin and we give it to a mouse, the mouse gains more weight for the same calorific intake. Exactly the same as we saw with Li Ping's study. There's something in the bacterial population present in there that is inducing obesity. Interestingly, it's not Enterobacter cloaceae B29. That's not the only fat-inducing bacterium out there. There's lots of others. What's interesting is if you take the same stool sample, the same bacteria, but you add Cristinicella minuta, one of these organisms that shows um, a high propensity in lean people, the mouse won't gain weight. Cristinicella minuta actively dampens down that obesity response. It protects the mouse from becoming obese on the same calorific intake. So one bug makes you fat, one bug makes you thin. You can get this bug, if you, find, if you could put it in a bottle and sell it in Whole Foods, you'd make a million dollars <laughs> overnight. It'd be amazing. But it's not as simple as that, right? Actually, the probiotic market is entirely unregulated. Anyone who's interested in making some money, um, currently it's, it's very easy to just put something in a bottle. I, I, in our lab, we went in and we went into Whole Foods once and um, in a totally unscientific manner, just uh, took, bought 30 types of probiotic and, um, and uh, Jared Hampton, myself and my lab sequenced the bacteria that are present in there. In the vast majority of them, it wasn't what it said on the tin. You know, uh, it is a really unregulated market. Anyway, um, this, is, this is for highly important. So this means that we could potentially have a, a microbial response that protects people from becoming obese. Now, where do those bacteria come from? Well, there's another part of this story. And um, this, this is a study. Actually, one of, one of the guys involved in this study is present in the room, uh, Sean Gibbons, who is one of our alums that's now doing a postdoc at MIT. Um, and I'll, I'll call him out in a bit, but anyway. Um, in this study, we, we, we looked at how the bacteria in the gut of a, of a, a mouse, in this case, responds to um, a change in diet. So, you know, when we changed the diet of Li Ping, certain bacteria disappeared. We went from an unhealthy diet to a healthy diet. He lost some of those obesity-inducing organisms. What happens when we give a mouse a load of high-fat, high-sugar diet? Um, it changes the microbial ecosystem inside that mouse. And it doesn't just make some organisms disappear. It also makes the, the rhythmicity, the temporal daily pattern, how it changes day to night of that microbial community, the microbial clock inside your gut, become disrupted. It no longer uh, follows a nice flowing pattern like the rest of your body. It follows a very disrupted pattern. And you have clocks throughout your body. Okay? You have clocks in pretty much every organ inside your body, and especially in your brain. The one in your brain is mostly um, are altered by the amount of day and night you see. So if you're chronically jet-lagged or you're working nights, um, you're going to have a disrupted um, circadian rhythm, a disrupted clock inside your brain, which alters your body chemistry. Okay? And we see this. If, you're, if you are working nights or you are chronically jet-lagged, I'm one of those chronically jet-lagged people. I've got to fly to China tomorrow. Um, you actually put on more weight for the same calorific intake. 
It's not all those business dinners and lunches. It's, anyway, it probably is, but um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's your body being disrupted by, by your timekeeping mechanism inside your body. So what happens is when we actually give this mouse a load of high-fat, high-sugar food, it does exactly the same thing as if you put the mouse through a disrupted sleep cycle. That somehow, the disruption of the circadian rhythms, the rhythmicity, the clocks inside your bacteria, inside your gut, actually affect rhythmicity and clocks inside your liver. And rhythmicity and clocks inside your brain can also fall out of sync with the ones inside your liver. And this actually causes your body to put on more weight. We've uncovered a mechanism, this is work at University of Chicago, by which diet induces obesity in the body. By altering the chemical phenotype and the clock genes inside our body, our body then dis is disrupted and puts on more weight for the same calorific intake. Now, I asked, asked you where those bacteria come from. The first one is from your mother, right? If you're, this is your starting culture, your sourdough bread, if you will. Um, your, mother, your mother gives you bacteria by one of two routes. If you're born via the traditional native natural route, you get your mother's vaginal microflora as your starting culture, right? That's the way you evolved, remember? You evolved to be delivered vaginally, and your body evolved to see those bacteria in its first weeks, months, years of life. And these bacteria stay with you for like a year and a half or more. Some of them can stay with you for, for the entire period of your life. If you're born cesarean section, you look like mother's skin, or the skin of the first person you come into contact with. It could be father's skin. And those skin bacteria colonize the child inside and out and fundamentally alter that starting culture. In ecology, we have something called the founder effect. Um, much the same way as if, if, you know, if, if it hadn't been the pilgrims that got to Plymouth Rock, if it had been some you know, German sect, it would have been a very different world, right? Um, and the founder effect changes the progression of the ecosystem development. So the ones that start out being there at the beginning can alter what happens later. And there is some evidence that this disruption between cesarean birth and, um, and uh, vaginal birth could lead to other phenotypes later in life, like obesity, um, even neurodevelopmental conditions, even autism um, and asthma, okay? And that's correlative. There's no actual direct evidence of it at the moment. The disruption of this very early in life from use of antibiotics early in birth, and we were talking about this earlier, can lead to a significant disruption in the types of bacteria we see, which can also have concomitant effects in that space, okay? But there's a way to get around that. Obviously, sometimes you have to have a cesarean section. You know, uh, you can't avoid it. So they've, uh, one of my colleagues developed a, uh, developed a technique or adopted a technique uh, whereby you place a, a small sponge inside the vaginal cavity during pregnancy, during birth, sorry, and then you literally hand colonize the baby with that sponge afterwards, right? <laughs> Sounds pretty gross, but it's actually an effective way at getting the right kinds of bacteria into that child at the starting point so it can develop normally in the way that nature intended. Um, your breast milk also has its own microflora inside it. And so this is another important point. Mother seems to actively recruit bacteria from the um, gastrointestinal cavity into the breast milk, and that, that then becomes a probiotic delivered by mother into, the, into the, the baby's gut. That probiotic, those bacteria inside the breast milk, are actually perfect for digesting, perfectly capable, perfectly adapted to digest the kinds of sugars and lipids and proteins you find in breast milk. Almost like it was, um, like, you know, planned somehow, or, <laughs> or evolved in that way. Um, and then what's remarkable is those bacteria are also very good at stimulating early immune responses in the gut. So we see that, that positive influence. Um, now, it's not the only story. Um, we, we also are very affected by the environment in which we live in, okay? So um, as I said before, the environment in which we live in now is very different from the one we grew up in. We have a, a great story of the Amish and the Hutterites. Both of them come from the same... Uh, place in, um, in Eastern Europe, the same uh, ancestral lineage. Uh, but the Hutterites have massively elevated asthma over the US average, and the Amish have virtually none, uh, no asthma at all. And the Amish live on their own individual family farms and constantly exposed to the kind of environment their ancestors grew up in, a family farm environment where they're interacting with the animals from birth. The Hutterites live on big communal farms where only boys over the age of 14 are actually allowed on the farm. So as children, None of them get exposure to the kind of farming environment that's great. Um, farming environment that the, the Amish do. So I was being signaled that I've got to hurry up. I get really excited about this because it's a really exciting topic, and then I go off on tangents. I've got to be careful. Anyway, 
Um, so, the, so we think that that early life exposure to the kind of environment your ancestors were being exposed to and the kind of bacteria they were being exposed to may have a significant influence on determining whether you're going to develop these kind of autoimmune conditions, okay? Um, and the environment that you and I grew up in is no better, probably worse than that of the Amish, of the, sorry, the Hutterites. It's the built environment. Um, in this room right now, the air is being very well climate controlled. The, uh, it's being dried. It's being uh, temperature monitored. Um, and it's not a particularly great environment for bacteria to survive and thrive in. In fact, we've done a really good job at making sure this environment is clean and sterile as possible. Okay? Um, that can change sometimes with funguses. But it, uh, when, when we look at the bacteria we find in this environment, it's mostly from people. It's mostly from people's skin. Even when we go onto the International Space Station, the bacteria we find up there are from the, the astronaut's skin. Okay? Um, um, and this is, the, this is the environment in which we're bringing up our children. I took my uh, first and second sons home, and I brought them into an environment where the only real microbial exposure they were getting inside the house was from the bacteria that were coming off of my skin and the mother's skin and their skin. And this fundamentally alters the trajectory of succession, because they're not getting that complex, rich exposure from the environment, which they, theoretically, as a species, evolved to acquire. And so we're very interested in this built environment and how that microbial transmission may be affecting the development of people. In the Home Microbiome Project, we actually looked at how bacterial interactions with our home fundamentally altered um, with different family units. So if you had four people in the family or one person in the family or, or, you know, or a big, complex family, it can alter how the microbial transitions and how the microbes move around that environment. And that could fundamentally alter the development of people. But we found something even more interesting that I'm going to talk about right now that the bacteria we left behind was entirely unique to the individuals. Take these two environments, the kitchen counter and the kitchen floor. This is time, uh, so we took samples every day for six weeks. A uh, person is, is a family with three people and three dogs, two, grown, uh, two parents and one grown child and the three dogs. Uh, if we look at the kitchen counter, it's mostly person three. There's no gender bias here, but it was the mother in the family and she did spend a lot of time in the kitchen, okay? Um, apart from when she left for a while, and uh, person two's, um, uh, we are an unknown blip, but we left for a while, and person two's microbiome took off. That was the father taking over the cooking because he had to fend for himself. Um, and this is highly important. We can actually identify those kind of activities. If we look at the kitchen floor, though, it's mostly dog, right? The dog bacteria are colonizing that surface. This is important. If you're an infant crawling around on the floor, that's going to be your exposure in an environment. And that might sound icky, right? Like, dog bacteria are dangerous because dogs are smelly and dirty, and we should, we should protect our children from those bacteria. I'm going to show you that's not necessarily the case. Um, this, this whole idea has led to the concept of the microbial cloud. Um, this is the bacteria we give off. This is pig pen, and pig pen gives off a lot of bacteria. If I walk, and I'm not allowed to walk, but if I walk like this, I'm actually shedding bacteria, around 32 million cells an hour, into my immediate environment. This blurs the line between your body and the environment you're living in, because you're constantly being colonized and shedding bacteria into this space, okay? And that means if you're sitting closer together, your microbes are being more interwoven. And actually, you guys are probably getting a lot of my oral bacteria right now, and I apologize for that. Sorry. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, but it means that we can track people's behaviors, because as they interact, as they physically interact, it changes their microbial flora. So this is a young couple living with a lodger, and these are microbial samples. The closer the dots are together, the more similar they are. And in, over here, on the left-hand side, you can see that the young couple are very microbiologically similar, much more so than they are to the lodger. This is because the young couple are physically interacting, and they're exchanging microbes much more frequently than they are with the lodger. But the lodger is still more microbiologically similar to the young couple because he lives in the same space um, than he is to anyone else in our study. And we're utilizing this to develop new crime-solving techniques. Uh, hopefully, we'll find some criminals. But um, I don't know if this is the right audience. Uh, I'm English. I stay out of your politics. Um, we actually went down. We've been working with uh, the police departments around the country in very warm places like Florida and Hawaii, where we can go in the winter, um, in order to um, actively develop with the National Institutes of Justice and the Department of Justice the microbial fingerprint you leave behind as a technique. So we're currently funded by those organizations to work with the PD and with their, uh, the, uh, their forensic units to figure out ways, this is Jared Hampton Marcel who works in my lab, figure out ways to capture the bacteria that are present on surfaces after a burglary has happened. We got two students to burgle this house. Oh, yeah, all right. and, um, and they're very 
particular about time. And when the two students burgled the house, it wasn't a real burger, we set it up. Um, we then went in straight afterwards and we sequenced the microbiome of all the floors and surfaces which they may have come into contact with. And then what we did is we sequenced the microbiome of the residents and their cat. And we extracted, we removed that signature of the residents and the cat from the stuff that was left on the floor. The residual microbiome we could find was human. And when we ran it against our database, which luckily contained our two students, we could identify each of those students with a 99.3% accuracy. But let's say they're not in our database. One thing we could uncover about those two students is they both drank heavily. <laughs> like 20 units a week. I don't know if that's heavy. It doesn't sound heavy, but anyway. Um, and, and one of them took migraine medicine because both of those attributes, both those lifestyle choices, changed their microbial flora to such an extent that they left a signature of the microbes they left behind. Okay? So this is very important in trying to develop new therapies. Now we can map the microbial profile. This is my family. Very or, or obvious, the feet interact with the floors and the hands interact with surfaces you touch with your hands. If we add dogs into that environment, it goes crazy. The microbial interactions are significantly more detailed. We know that couples that live with a dog are more microbiologically similar because the dog is promiscuously sharing microbes in a much more rigorous way. This led to me, uh, I, 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 we, uh, we rescued a dog from Kentucky. He was in a kill shelter as a puppy. If you think he's cute now, you should have seen him as a puppy. Anyway, we rescued him and he's now been sharing our microbes and sharing them around our environment in a, in a rigorous way. And this is a good thing, right? That kid crawling around on the floor, getting that microbial exposure from the dogs, may actually be picking up particular dog bacteria, such as lactobacillus, which when entered into a mouse model at least, show a significant capability to ameliorate the conditions of asthma. These, these, these mice do not show as much wheezing when they have this bacteria present in their intestine. Because the intestine is linked to the rest of the system. Okay? Everything starts here, my mum told me. Um, <laughs> We're working in a new $800 million hospital at the University of Chicago to try and apply these same techniques. Um, and we're uncovering ecological trends between before the hospital was operational, there's a hospital in blue over here, and then after the hospital was operational. These are, these are floor patient samples from all across this environment. And we see a significant alteration of that relationship. And that changes the way we view hospitals. I'm not going to go into that right now because she's indicating to me. But um, We're putting microbes in your medical records. Uh, we're actually actively uh, encouraging people to collect their microbiomes, and we're developing at the University of Chicago and Argonne sensors which actually help us to track people in real time and help them to track themselves. And American gut and British gut, for me, I said British, should say English, damn. Anyway, um, American gut was uh, developed by us as a crowdfunding routine with uh, other partners from around the country to actually actively allow people to have their microbiome sequenced for 100 bucks and that data goes into a public repository which is being used by clinicians and scientists around the world to um, contextualize their microbial profile. And utilizing this information, we're actually able to start designing um, specific personalized therapies to treat certain conditions. This kid, um, he's, a, he's a, a boy, he has crippling food allergies, and so his family came to us and we sequenced their microbiome in detail. And we identified bacteria present in the dad, the mum, and, um, and the daughter, the sister, which were significantly elevated in those guys and, and completely absent in the child. And so what we started to do is take those organisms, culture them up, and put them into a personalized probiotic from the parents, and we're now introducing them into the son. And so far, this son's um, food allergies have been significantly ameliorated. So we are trying to use this information to develop these personalized therapies. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And I will be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jack. Uh, does this mean that Genesis has it wrong and on the sixth day God created man and on the seventh he rested? No, he created the microbes. Yeah, he did. I wish bacteria were present in the Bible. It would make everything so much easier to deal with. Um, but somehow, somehow in, in the almighty hand he forgot to mention anything about that. Ah, oh, they shall, the meek. The bacteria are the meek. That's awesome. They are. They're the smallest organisms. They're actually, um, if you take all the bacteria and viruses in the ocean, they actually weigh, they weigh about the same as 178,000 blue whales. So, I mean, it, it's a lot of biomass out there. They're the most abundant thing on Earth. Yes? So, the, uh, the, the conventional wisdom used to be that asthma was grossly overrepresented in children and poverty. Yeah. 
what their environment is called dirty anymore. But that doesn't seem to actually quite... It doesn't fit within... It's way more complex. I mean, uh, we do definitely do see an elevated uh, level of asthma recruitment in populations where, where children are close to roads or, or large areas where you get a lot of particulate matter in the air. Um, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, but, but with regard to asthma, right, there's also evidence that, that in populations that have moved from rural to urban areas that reduced exposures, for example, to parasites. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, and it, when I say to people that if you brought a dog into your home with your newborn child, that would potentially reduce the amount of asthma. They panic about that as well, because conventional wisdom says dogs actually induce asthmatic attacks and induce wheezing from their fur and from their um, skin cells. And this, uh, this is probably because those children are already inappropriately set up. Um, this is very important. So we're actually trying to develop um, techniques to introduce the right kinds of bacteria back into um, children, uh, again, at UChicago and at the MBL, um, to try and find out which bacteria they're missing and then introduce them back in. Uh, people, there's a couple of papers recently that have shown you just need four organisms in a small cohort of people. Four organisms will protect you against um, uh, the development of asthma. It's a bit more complicated than that, though. Oh. Yeah. We just don't know. We've actually looked into this problem uh, because when we speak to the FDA about this, they want to know that dose-dependent response for the treatment. And we don't, we're looking into those problems for every single condition we deal with. It might have to do with whether we incorporate parts of the genomes or whatever of the bacteria or, or whether it's them acting on their own. It's, it's, it's rare that we are actually accumulating bacterial genomic DNA into our own genome. It's them usually acting on their own. I'll let, I'll let these guys do it, because otherwise right. I, get, I get, like, favoritism. Uh, yeah, this may have already been asked, but I guess it, my question is, if I have the right bacteria inside of me, does that mean I can eat whatever I want? No. Or, 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 or I just don't want to eat more than I really need? Well, it, again, it's your body's an ecosystem, right? So there's a couple of examples I'll just go over very quickly. One, um, when Leaping started eating hamburgers again, you know, we got rid of Enterobacter cloacea. When he started eating hamburgers again after, it, it's an experiment, I'm sure. It was an experiment. <laughs> his Enterobacter cloacea came back. Um, that B29 strain reappeared in his gut. It was probably there in a very, very low abundance. And then when the ecosystem changed, it came back. He started putting on more weight. I actually lost 40 pounds myself by changing my diet. Um, I, went, I was 205 pounds. I went down to 165. Um, by changing my diet to um, alter my microbial transition in, uh, and my, my microbial clocks inside my gut, based on the research I showed there. And um, I lost that in 12 weeks very rapidly. Um, now, um, I've got a bit more lazy and, and slack with the kind of diet I apply and when I'm eating my food, and my weight started to slowly creep up. So no, it's, 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 it, there's no, there's no uh, w winning size solution here, one size fits all. You have to be sensible. You have to do exactly what your mother said. Eat a big breakfast, eat healthy, eat your greens, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Sucks, but. <laughs> um, hi, thank you. Uh, can you explain this slide, please? Does it mean that environmental simplification is increasing allergies and asthma, and what are the implications of that? Yes, exactly what I'm inferring with this slide, although it be in a cartoon fashion, and I'm not entirely sure I'd suffer peer review uh, angst over it. But the, the basic premonition is, you know, if you can take your children and you can expose them to a more rich microbial diversity below a certain age, above a certain age, we're not entirely sure it makes a lot of difference. But when their immune system is developing, especially when their neurological pathways are developing, we actually see a significant um, ability to augment their, their physiological state by uh, uh, increasing their microbial exposure. Now, there are very, very few studies where we've done that in children. We just published one with cow's milk allergy. When we got them as infants below six months, we were able to ameliorate cow's milk allergy in, in all the infants we treated by adding the right kinds of bacteria back in, because we published that a few weeks ago. But it's very few instances we've done it in, in humans. Animal models, it's, it's very robust. If we get the mice, when the mice are infants and we add the bacteria in, they are protected from the later development of those conditions. If you add the bacteria in after they're infants, when they started to mature, you get no protection. Um, so I'm interested in your work on autism. Um, yeah, I didn't cover that as much, and I, I, yeah, I, I wanted to, but they cut my time. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> um, well, can you address it a little bit now? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that uh, I have a child with autism. So do um, I. I know that. I <laughs> from reading. So, um, 
So I think that, you know, given that we don't really know what the cause is of autism today, um, I understand a bit from what you covered in, uh, in how bacteria can affect autism. Yeah. Are, are you saying that it can, similar to your discussion of asthma, ameliorate the effects of autism? Do you think that there is a strong linkage between the neurological development or the, the sort of clustering of neurons and our gut? Um, yeah, so or let me, none let me, of the above. No, no, both of the above. But let me tackle one point. Um, yes. Neurological diversity in our community is incredibly important. I don't actually want to cure my son's autism because he's wonderful just the way he is, and it's not crippling his life, yeah. you know? But there are children who are locked in, and they have significant problems actually dealing with uh, life because of their autism, okay? And autism is a spectrum. Right. So not, there's not, again, no one-size-fits-all solution. But what we have shown is that a disruption of bacteria in the gut can cause your gut lining to become much more leaky, right? This leaky gut syndrome that we hear about a lot nowadays. And um, that allows more metabolites to pass through the, uh, the, the um, pass across the gut membrane into the serum. And some of those metabolites have been shown to increase permeability in the blood-brain barrier, leading to um, an alteration in neurological chemistry. If that's happening very early in life, as we just said with the development of those neurons, it could be leading to changes in, in neurological connections mm -hmm. and even the myelination ratio we see on, on nerve endings in the brain and in the central nervous system. That's the fatty tissue around the nerve. Um, that is potentially the target we're going after. We don't have absolute evidence of that right now, but that's a, a lot of evidence to suggest that we are in the right ballpark. The brain initiative um, that the White House launched, and we have a microbiome initiative being launched in January, but the Brain Initiative actually significantly helped us in this space because it allowed us to recruit people through Argonne and, and UChicago who are helping to develop our neurological program and allowing us to visualize those neurons and model them in computers so we can see what impact this disruption in the microbial flora has upon that development. And it could be not just in the brain, but also in the nerve endings inside your gut. Mm -hmm. Your enteric nervous system is really important. But anyway, We have time for one more question oh. right in the back. I like this. <laughs> with, with your mouse studies originally on obesity, is there any sense of age dependence in terms of when that can be induced or reversed? Uh, for obesity, I, ooh, I, I'm not aware if that's actually been looked at. I mean, so the, in the studies, we were talking about this earlier, in the studies where antibiotics have been used to disrupt microflora, yes. Happening very early in the development of the, of the animal actually leads to the obese phenotype. Later, if you take antibiotics um, as a, as a um, juvenile or, or adolescent mouse, it doesn't lead to an induction of obesity, and the microbiome bounds back quite rapidly after that. Um, in humans, we just haven't done enough trials because it's ethically very difficult to just give lots of children antibiotics and the other ones not. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but theoretically, uh, the, the same premise should be true. Now, um, yeah, age could be a significant factor. Yeah. Uh, Jack, I, I just want to take the liberty to ask you to comment a little bit about, um, you referenced your partnership with MBL. Can yes. you talk a little about, about the new experiences and opportunities that partnership is bringing to students? Yes, just because it's in the card. backyard okay. here for everyone, and um, we didn't give you enough time, but I think people would be interested to know yeah, how so students we, are benefiting. Yeah, we've developed a, a really exciting graduate program, a boot camp, like uh, we were in the army, when we literally take everybody down there and we trap them in Woods Hole, which is an awesome place to be trapped, to have beaches and everything. And uh, we, we basically hammer them with knowledge as much as we possibly can. And a lot of my graduate students are now taking advantage of that boot camp to learn everything from neuro neurological pathways to, uh, to, to uh, uh, statistics, um, to microbiology, to uh, molecular engineering um, at the base level. So they actually start out their graduate career with this really exciting multidisciplinary factor, right? And the undergraduates are taking advantage of it as well. We, we have a lot of undergraduate training programs out there. And I'm taking advantage of it because there's actually an excellent year-round research program at the MBL. And even though I don't necessarily want to travel there in the winter and the summer's more awesome, um, I'm still actually um, actively collaborating with uh, my colleagues out there and, and taking, uh, taking the resources that we have out there and utilizing them. They have one of the world's best marine resources centers it, you know, it, that you can find. Um, that's why it's one of the world's best. Uh, uh, I'm losing my sense of, uh, of um, uh, purpose. But the, uh, 
uh, the uh, MRC actually helps us, and we, we started working um, on an immune model in an, an innate um, uh, organism called Siona, uh, which is a tunica, it's a little uh, thing that sticks onto rocks. Um, and when we challenged this thing with uh, bacteria that it got from, um, theoretically from its mother, it seemed to change the development of the microbiome. So uh, we're actually utilizing Siona as a model for microbiome development in children, in, in, in relationship to the work we're doing in children already and trying to uh, manage that system, that animal model, new animal model, in a way that helps us to understand how this works in people. So um, the MBL has been a phenomenally useful, if you're willing to take advantage of it, resource that faculty members and students can take advantage of. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. I didn't read from my cards. So. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Sean Desai. I graduated from the college in 2005, and this year I'm taking over as president of the Alumni Club of Boston. Um, so of course I'm going to shill to you guys what you guys should do to get more engaged. Um, first of all, I want to thank you guys for showing up. Uh, it's awesome that you guys come out. It's awesome to engage with the university, and I couldn't think of a more informative or entertaining way to do so. Um, and I also want to thank our Alumni Board of Governors and the Alumni Club of Boston leadership team. This year, we have a brand new team. It's 15 people strong, so it basically multiplied threefold over last year. Um, some of those guys are here tonight, so if you guys could stand and be recognized. Um, these are people that you should be talking to if you want to get more involved with the club. Um, we'd love to see more at events. So the Harper isn't the only thing that we do. We do a lot more. And since we're a volunteer-led club, we can make it into anything that we want. So your input is crucial. We'd love to get you guys engaged. We'd love to get you guys participating. Um, so if you'd like to know more about Harper Lectures, the Alumni Travel Program, or any of the other university events that we host here or around the country, um, please talk to one of us, stop by, say hello, talk to one of our staff that's here um, from the Alumni Association, or come out to the registration table. A couple of us will be out there and we're happy to talk to you. So at the beginning of the lecture, Tracy mentioned that we have a 125,000 person engagement goal. And just by being here tonight, you guys are actually are engaging in that, um, helping us meet that total. So I want to encourage you guys to keep showing up and joining thousands of alumni around the world and giving support to things like scholarships. You saw a couple of the students in the video earlier today. Um, new inquiry, attending events, coming up with events. So if you got some ideas, please talk to me. Or leading reunions and so much more. Um, so a couple of the things that I want to shill out to you guys that we're doing over the next couple of months. Uh, we're doing fun stuff, uh, educational stuff. On November 4th, there's a wine tasting at Urban Grape that's in the South End. Uh, we're doing our career month on November 18th. So if you are going through a career, career transition or if you want to polish up on your skills or if you want to network with other alumni in the area, I definitely encourage you guys to do so. It's at the Omni Parker House. Um, there's a new Flux exhibit at the Museum of Fine Arts, and it's actually curated by somebody who graduated from the University of Chicago. She's a senior curator at the MFA, and she's actually going to be leading the tour so we get the inside of the inside scoop of what's going on there. And if you're planning really far out ahead in January, we're actually going to be talking to the assistant general manager of the Celtics, and he's an MBA from the University of Chicago. And Oh, oh he's an... Un He deals with numbers. I wrote papers. I don't know. <laughs> so he's going to be meeting us at the TD Garden, and he'll talk to us, and we'll watch a Celtics game together. Um, so all these things you can find out on our specific website, uchicagoboston.org. If you guys are in the area, if you have the physical address in Boston and it's not updated with us, please make sure that you update it so you get all of our emails. We have a Facebook page. All you have to do is Google U Chicago Boston Facebook. You'll find us. Soon we're going to have an Instagram account so we can just embarrass you guys by taking pictures at events and posting them. So all these things are happening. It's a really exciting year. We're here to make it happen. We hope that you guys will too. So thanks for coming out. Thank you.